Hey everyone, in this video we'll be looking at Chapter 9 of Practical Object Oriented Design in Ruby, which is called Designing Cost-Effective Tests. Testing is important but time-consuming. It's important because it reduces cost to changing your code base later, and because future engineers who look at it can see what you are intending your code to do, whereas it might have been somewhat mysterious on its own. The truth is that getting in the habit of writing tests is sort of an onerous process if you're not naturally inclined to it because you have to invest a lot of time writing code that doesn't contribute to your app's functionality and thus it's less satisfying. Maybe someone out in the audience is at a level where they would argue otherwise but for most people this is unfortunately the case. That doesn't mean that it isn't important and that's why it has a chapter of its own here. So what are some of the things you get along with having tests? There are several benefits, which you can see on page 193. Tests help you find bugs early on in the development cycle, which is great now and in the future. Tests also supply documentation because you can look back later at them and figure out what was going on in your mind or in the original author's mind at the time when you slash they were originally writing it. Less significantly, you can have tests that are pending to remind yourself later of what you meant to do. Another benefit is that it exposes design flaws. If your tests are really onerous to set up, then there's a fair chance that you've put too much functionality into the classes that they're supposed to be testing. And I've definitely been in that boat before. Having said that, this is a place where academia and real life don't line up 100% because there are instances where it really is the best design to have a complicated class, and as a result, you have to have a complicated test. But this is a good rule in general. You should test the messages for an object's public interfaces, and perhaps let be what Sandy calls unstable internal details. This is kind of a judgment call on your part. I would say that you should at least test all the public interfaces, and if you think it would be valuable to test private ones as well, then do that. I can see instances where both would be valid. Another thing to think about is only testing message transactions in one place. So if an action is sending a message from one class to another, then the test for it should be in the scope of the second class's test, the receiving end. And it should be making sure that the transformation, or whatever kind of processing is supposed to happen, happens correctly. On the topic of saying when to test, Sandy says that you should write tests before writing your actual code. This is called, as you might imagine, test-driven development. It's a gold standard and there are people who swear by it as the only way to go. And Sandy seems to be in that boat. There are other people who feel that doing testing first is inefficient for a couple reasons. Part of that is the fact that you have to know in advance the whole design of your functionality before starting. And so for folks who where, where design is an emergent process, you'll end up making an inferior product if you force yourself to project everything up front and then limit yourself to the confines of what you projected going forward. There are a couple different testing frameworks that you can use for doing Ruby tests and the most common ones are Minitest and RSpec. Personally, I recommend RSpec. That's the one that I've spent the most time with and had a pretty positive experience with. There's also another paradigm besides TDD to be aware of, which is BDD. BDD stands for Behavior Driven Development, and it differs from TDD. BDD makes more sense if you're getting requirements from non-technical people on the team because it lets you get summaries of the features you need in plain language, and that makes sure that your boss or the project manager or whoever will be happy with what you come up with. You might have something like, it submits a form to support at company.com as the summary for your test, right? Anyone can understand that. Conversely, if you're interacting mostly with other engineers or just yourself, then doing TDD is going to be sufficient unless you care to flesh it out for your own sake. So remember I was saying that the classes on the receiving end of messages are the ones that get tested? This is how we do it, and we're on page 200, by the way, or 201 even. Sandy points out that our code shouldn't have deep coupling of objects together like you see on line 24 of page 201. That's what she calls an outgoing message as part of the class running its own function and has the potential to break in the future. So instead of having wheel.new, you should update the gear class itself to take an instance of wheel already made to get rid of 
that possible breaking point. You can see that here on page 205 on line 12. Sandy has a really good definition of what a test is too. And we've been using that word, you know, for this whole chapter without, without giving like a real definition. So it's an assertion about the result of calling a method. In other words, if you call a method and it returns the value you expect, then you can say it is working. And if it doesn't, then you can say it isn't finished yet. Conceptually, that's a very simple thing to think about, but maybe a little bit trickier in the wild when you're actually doing it. So that means that when you're actually writing the test, you have a line or two of code setting up the object to be tested. And then another line that's the assertion, the part where it says, you know, object.method should equal correct return value. The mini test example on page 203 is not as readable as RSpec in my opinion, but this is the mini test way of saying it, the, the test goes down. So we talked a little earlier before about the fact that a gear internal method requires a wheel to get created and that has the possibility for breaking which is why we need to refactor it out. But it's also important to note that if we have a wheel getting past the creation of a gear instance that means every single time we make a gear there will be a wheel regardless of whether or not the gear inches method ever gets called. So that implementation is more expensive from a resource usage standpoint. Not that it isn't worth it, but it is worth keeping in mind that, and, and perhaps contemplating on whether you want your app to save resources or to be more decoupled. Conversely, there's a possibility of a break if you're injecting an instance of a class. If you're calling a method on it and the method gets renamed in the injected class's definition. The nice thing in this case is that some other tests will break as a result and you'll be alerted to that right away. Zooming out a little bit, think about what we would do if there were a lot of different objects that can be sent to gear besides wheel. The thing they all have in common is that they all answer the diameter method, thus calling them diameterizable. That would be the name of the role. In this case, Sandy suggests that you make an exemplary diameterizable class and test that rather than testing all the objects that, pop that could possibly be tested. That'll save you a lot of time. That concept is called a double, and you can see that here on page 210. It's named the method name plus double, so that you know exactly what it is and what it's about. And it has exactly one method, unsurprisingly its diameter, which gives you the ability to instantiate it and deal with the valid value. This is called stubbing, and Sandy defines that as a version of diameter that returns a canned answer. There's a testing belief that it's okay to not test private methods on the reality that they're only called by the class itself. And thus, if anything goes wrong in the future, it's easy to pinpoint the problem and rectify it. Sandy points out that if it's not functioning properly, other classes' tests will point you to at least the class that's breaking. And from there, it's a short journey to identify the culprit private method. Test of private methods also gives the wrong signal to other developers, namely that it's okay to use those private methods when it is in fact not. So what do we do with them? There's somewhat of a judgment call for you to make when facing private methods. If you're in a situation where you have too many private methods, you might be better off moving them to another class. That's subjective, so trust your best judgment. Alternately, you can opt to not have private methods at all, and that'll keep you from having to face this issue entirely. Though, you will have to test everything now. Having said all that, Sandy might as well put a big asterisk on the end of everything she's said so far because in a later section she says it could be okay to test private methods even though they tend to be more unstable private interfaces, but the circumstance for that to be valid is if you're planning to come back later and refactor, which arguably you should be planning anyways. That last section was all about incoming messages. And we're moving now to outgoing message messages, which starts on page 215. These outgoing messages are queries and commands. Queries are asking something of another class, and commands are telling objects to change. Now of those two, right, of queries and commands, you can ignore the queries. The reason for this is simply that its ability to function doesn't matter to anything other than the method that's calling it. In this case, it's the 
gear inches action column diameter, but nowhere else in the gear class needs it. And of course, the ability for diameter itself to be functional is tested in the wheel class. So you can leave that bit of functionality alone here. What you do have to care about testing is functionality that impacts other things, transformations, passing information from place to place, and so on. For things like that, Sandy talks about something called a moth, which is effectively a clone of some other object that can respond to the behavior of the object it's replicating, as well as some assertions to be shown as true or false for the sake of the test. For an example, check out this bit on pages 216 to 218. There's a new attribute here called observer, and it gets past the values of the chain ring and cog when called in the changed method on line 21. The change method itself gets called a couple times on line 17, for example. So now you can see the test here on 218, and you can see the expected results that you expect the change method to have been called when set cog is itself called, like change gets called in the course of, of executing set cog. Then you have this verify method here to, to check to see if this assertion is true. And it turns out that it is, so this test is passing correctly. Now remember way back when we were talking about duct types. They're proxies used to encapsulate shared behavior. And it makes perfect sense that they should be tested now that we're on the subject. Believe it or not, I like to look at the final product and then go back to how it got there. So bearing in mind our example from earlier chapters about the trip preparer duct type, let's see the result on page 223. We expect the prepare trip method to receive the correct message, which is an instance of the trip class. Now looking back at the preparer class definitions on page 221, we can see that as it's written, the prepare trip method does indeed receive an instance of trip. And so back in the test, we can see the prepare being called and so we can see that it does come up with the result that we want and are expecting. As you're adding new code and adding new tests to them, there's the meta challenge you face where the names of methods called in tests themselves may change, which is an unfortunate situation to be in, but a surmountable one. Take a look at the double on 224. That breaks in future revisions when you switch to using a width method, for example, rather than diameter. That breaking will point you to the right place, though, and you'll be able to make adjustments as necessary. Testing inheritance is probably the most intuitive of the aspects of testing that we've covered so far. It basically just entails instantiating objects in an inheritance tree and making sure that they respond to all of the methods that they should, given the classes and superclasses they inherit from. And of course, it's important to test callbacks that happen like post initialize to make sure that everything is instantiated properly. It's worth calling out as well that you have to test inherited methods at different points in the tree. So for example, say there's a not implemented error raised on the top object and a default value defined in the third object down. So when giving expectations for that method, you have to say in the context of subclass two, which doesn't define it explicitly, we expect the not implemented error. Whereas the fourth subclass, you would expect it to have the default value that was defined in subclass three. That's a lot to think about, and I'll leave you to glance over the examples if that sounds interesting. This is the last chapter of the book. So I wanna wrap up by acknowledging that there are a lot of Ruby tutorials out there and it means a lot to me that you spent time to watch these. I learned a lot from making these summaries and I hope that you did and found them helpful too. I'll see you all in the next video.